Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Well, welcome to church this morning. Uh, if you're watching online, there's a, there, there's a bunch, and uh, I don't know how much better it sounds in the room. It sounds amazing in my ears. I know it sounds good in here, but online, uh, if you go watch later, it sounds great. So I just want to give a big uh, shout out to Matt and Jake from Church Front. If you haven't heard of them, you can look them up on YouTube. They helped us out with everything. He was uh, messaging me uh, up, up there. <laughs> if you saw me on my phone. Uh, we had we still had a couple little hiccups, but uh, he did say that everything sounded great, and he wanted me to tell the music team that they sounded phenomenal this morning, and they did. Y'all sounded good, even though there was a lot of people missing, and we had a lot of stuff, um, you know, go crazy this week. But uh, by faith, we're gonna just keep keep trucking on. I think was the word of the day, and. In, in the team meeting, and by faith is actually what we're going to be speaking on a little bit today. Uh, if you can stand for the reading of the Word of God, please. I'm going to be in Hebrews 11 today, <clears throat> starting in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He did not know where he was going. That right there, that's enough right there. By faith. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, Robbie, <laughs> was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who, made, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And all these people were still living by faith. Somebody say, by faith. faith. Still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Much like uh, our online audience, you do not have to be somewhere physically to be involved. You can still welcome it from a distance, or you can deny it from a distance. Mm. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Who's looking for a better one? A better one, a heavenly one. Who is looking forward to the better heavenly country? Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to the city that is prepared for each and every single one of us. Mm. I'm excited to bring this today. I'm probably going to get crazy tongue-tied and everything. This has been burning in me a little bit more and more since uh, before we left a couple weeks ago for Ocean Isle. Um, But I, I do believe that God is taking us somewhere but first, we need to be prepared for it. We need to be prepared for the path that he has, not only you on, but who, uh, what he has us on as a church as well. But with that, preparing for the path, as we move forward, you also need to be prepared for the pushback. Because anytime you're going forward, the enemy is going to push back. And he has been really pushing back this morning. <laughs> so be prepared. Be prepared for the path, for the purpose, for your promise Because there has been, as you know, if you've been coming here for a little bit of time, there's been this ongoing shift within the church. But I believe that God is setting the stage and he's moving all the pieces in place for the story that he is still still telling through us and through you. I've been feeling it. I've been feeling the vision kind of bubbling up and getting closer and closer to the surface. Uh, And, you know, obviously, like many things in in faith and and with God, I don't know how it's going to happen. 
I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know when it's going to happen because he doesn't do that. But I do know the why. And the why is something that somebody told you just a few weeks ago. God is not through with us yet. He's not through with you yet. If you're still breathing right now, he's still not done with you. So that is the why. He wants to use us to spread his gospel as far and as wide as possible, as supernaturally possible. So it's time to say goodbye yesterday and move forward because there is no turning back. There is no fallback plan with Jesus. We have to continue to move forward because he is the only plan. So today we are charging forward because, and the title of the message is, where I have been is not where I'm going. Where I have been is not where I'm going. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything that you're doing. We thank you for your, your protection. We pray the healing and the, uh, just the continued protection and provision over this church and in each and everyone's lives. I pray that you use me as your vessel. Don't let me speak, but let the Holy Spirit speak. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Tell your neighbor, I'm moving forward. I'm, I'm moving forward. Where we have been is not where we are going. <clears throat> I read a... Uh, I want to use an illustration I read in a book recently, so if the internet wants to freak out and say I stole it, um, kind of. But uh, I want you to imagine that you have spent your entire life, and some of you this isn't hard to do, you've spent your entire life living in one small area with everyone that you know. Everything is around. Your entire family is located within uh, just a, a mile or two of each other. And you don't do much moving around other than, you know, maybe just a little bit here and there. But everything that you know, every, everybody that you know, all your family, they're all located right within one another in a small amount of area. And one day someone comes up and they say, hey, uh, I've got this big plot of land that I want to give to you. Everything's paid for. Your moving expenses are paid for. All you got to do is put your stuff in boxes but I'm going to give it to you for free. You don't have to spend a dime. And while you're at it, when you get there, I'm going to write you a check for $10 million. Now, who is, who is already all over it? Yeah, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying in church. I'll tell you right now. Some of y'all are like, I'll do it for 50 bucks. Get me out of St. Augustine. So that's it, right? He's going to give you provision. He's going to give you land. But the, the catch is you don't know where it is. You have no idea where you're going to end up. And it may not really matter since you know, you know that you're going to be getting a special land and you're going to be getting uh, special provision and all your needs will be met. But would you, would you still say yes if like Abraham, God came up to you and said, I want to do a new thing through you and I want to move through you and move you to a new area, but you're not going to have any idea of what it's going to look like when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. You're just going to have to follow me and trust me on the way there. So to give you some backstory, this is Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We are still living in that promise. We are still living in that promise. When you come to Jesus, you are supernaturally grafted to be one of Abraham's heirs, one of his children. And so, like I was talking about earlier, moving around, in Abraham's time, they were a nomadic people. They would only travel anywhere from 10 to maybe 20 miles a day to search out food that they needed and that their, their livestock and their herds needed. They had to go find water. You couldn't just stay in one spot like a, a Best Western and you know call up room service and somebody bring you bottles of water for your herd. Uh, they were a tribal people, and they valued family so greatly that it was extremely unlikely and unusual that a family unit would be more than a few miles apart. Now, some of you who hate your in-laws are probably uh, just, you imagine that this has got to be the worst nightmare in your entire life, 
But uh, for those of us that have already had children and you know that sometimes you need a break, it's really nice when you can say, hey, go over to Gigi's house so mommy and I can just sit here in silence for about 20 minutes <laughs> instead of being asked for something every five seconds. Uh, yeah, so everybody's there, everybody's around, and it would be highly unlikely, you know, that they would be far apart. So this means it's great for the kids. I know that it sounds silly and we laugh about it, but in reality, uh, and I think for the grandparents as well, being able to have access to not just your children who are, who are grown and moved out, but to have access to their children, your grandchildren, and to, to spend time with them each and every day and to make memories with them and the children get to also make memories with their grandparents. That's a blessing in itself. But uh, does anybody know, have you ever heard the phrase, but God? But God. Has anybody ever had God interrupt your plans? You've been doing one path, and God came in, and he was like, nope, swipe all the pieces off the board, and now you have no idea what you're doing. And uh, God shows up, and he interrupts your plan. So that's, that's Abraham one day, and I I'm, I'm, I'm know that in the text at this time, his name is still Abram, but for the sake of uh, it being easier, I'm just going to say Abraham, since that turned into his name. Uh, if that's a point of contention for you, I promise you I will say something much more offensive within the next few minutes. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, God shows up, calls Abraham out, and out of everyone on earth, God calls Abraham out to go to this new area. And if you didn't know, at this moment in time, Abraham is 75 years old. 75 years old. He's still going by his past identity. He's still living with his family. If you're 40 and you're still living with your mom and dad, something is way wrong. But 75, I mean, whoo, get out. But he's already lived so long that uh, by most people's standards, you would say that you're, you're already set in your ways. You ever heard that? Like, oh, that's just me. That's just how I am. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, that's, that's just how I am. I'm too old to learn anything new. I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too old to do anything new. And, you know, the church can't use an old guy like me to do anything around here. There's all these young people already stepping up. So, you know, I'm just going to sit back and, and sit in the seats. And I'm not really going to do anything because, you know, there's all these young people... Uh, you know, already taken over and handling everything. But let me, let me show you that when you look at the life of Abraham, it proves to you that age does not have any effect on your anointing. Age does not matter and it does not affect your anointing. It does not matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. When God calls you forward, when God calls you into something and gives you a purpose, when he reveals your purpose, over your life. Your age will never affect your anointing. Abraham, 75. Isaac, the promised son, doesn't come until 25 years later. I'm not having a child at 100. I'm already counting down until they're 18, and I can have my wife back and just be able to have a nice uh, dinner and a meal and those kinds of things. David was anointed as a child to be king of Israel. And my voice is still cracking like a child. And Daniel, in his teens, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they're all in their teens when they get captured and taken into Babylon. But God rewards them for their faithfulness. Jeremiah was called by God at the ripe age of 17. Rahab, when she was a prostitute, this likely meant that she was in her late teens to early to mid-20s. These are all young people, so you're like, yeah, point proven. They're all young. Moses was 80 when God called him to go back to Egypt and get the Israelites out of captivity. When God wants to use you, he will use you. When God wants to use you, he will use you. When. It is up to him. It is completely up to him. It doesn't matter if you're 50 or 15. When he says, it's your time, guess what? It's your time. And yes, you can say no. And the argument can be made that, you know, if I don't do it, God will surely pick someone else. Maybe, but the kingdom is missing out on a position being filled when you're not fulfilling the role that you're supposed to be stepping into. And maybe you hear us talk about, your pur about purpose here all the time. Maybe you haven't, you haven't discovered your purpose yet and you, and you have no idea what God is doing to you, but he is refining you while you seek him before you're ready to be sent. So we see Abraham called at the, uh, the ripe young age of 75. 
to leave everything behind and follow God, to remove yourself from where you have been firmly rooted for your entire life. And, and this was crazy. I found this out as I was studying it. So his family came from the land of Ur and settled in Haran. And Haran actually, uh, I don't remember what the original word was, it, but it actually meant path. So it's funny that he was headed on one path and God showed up and steered him onto a different path. But he came from Ur, Ur and settled in Haran And we're not told exactly the status of their religion, but the people from this region likely worshiped the ancient Babylonian pantheon of gods, in particular, the moon god named Sin, S-I-N. So when God was looking for someone to establish his covenant on earth, when he was looking for someone through the lineage that Jesus would come down, where Jesus would cast off heaven and come down to be a man, to be mocked, to be murdered so he could be raised on the third day for your sins, for your eternal life. God did not look for someone how we look for someone. He didn't look for someone like Samuel looked for someone. He didn't care how handsome someone was, how tall they were. He didn't care about their height. He didn't care how smart they were. He didn't look for a degree or a PhD. He didn't look for talent. God came down and he looked for someone who would simply trust him. He picked a guy completely rooted in a pagan culture and called him out. And he called him out from worshiping sin. And he called him out from darkness. He called him out of a destiny of death and gave him a purpose to establish his divine culture. And here today, God is calling you out. He is calling you out of your sin. He's reaching to you to pull you out of the darkness. He wants to do a new thing through you, to reach people through you, to impact people through you. But are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? Will you do what it takes? In verse one, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, go from your people, go from your father's household. If you take these apart, it it narrows the focus to things that would progressively matter more. Moving from your country, okay, that's probably not fun. As crazy as the U.S. is right now, I don't see another country. I'm like, I would rather go there. Uh, And then Moving from your people, moving from this city, from all that you know. Okay, same thing. And then you've got to make new memories and meet new people. Still kind of all right. But moving from your father's household, moving away from your family, every single bot, every single person that you know, everyone in your family. And for what? A land that he would be shown. Nothing that he has been, uh, nothing that he can imagine or see. He's barely given any details. And he doesn't even have the real destination yet. He just says, a land that I will show you. But you need to see that it is called faith because it is trusting in God. It is faith because it is relying on God. It is faith because sometimes you are given the direction, walk this way. And sometimes you are given the destination, you're going to end up here. But you are never going to be given both. You will be given the direction. You will be given the destination. But most of the time, you're not going to give both because God will not give you all the details because that doesn't require faith. If I'm told everything I need to do to reach the next point in my life and be where God wants to take me, I'm not relying on God. I'm relying on myself to follow exactly what he already said. And that doesn't take faith. That's not hard. If God says, hey, for the next two years, you're not going to be able to pay any of your bills and you're going to think that you're going to be homeless. But at the end of it, let's just go super extreme. One day you're going to walk into a gas station and, and, and buy a scratch off for your last dollar and you win $10 million. If he laid that out for you, you'd be like, all right, cool. Two years, that's horrible. I'll set a timer on my iPhone, but I know when I get down there, that's going to be great. That's not how it works. You've got to go through the two years of homelessness and trusting him to meet your needs, trusting him to put groceries on your doorstep, to put gas in your tank. God doesn't give us all the details because we will depend on the details instead of trying to move forward in faith. And we think by uh, anybody tried to help God, 
in his promise for you. You tried to, you know, oh, you, you told me that you're taking me here, but it's taking a little bit longer. So I'm going to start doing stuff to make this happen. And you don't make the promise. God makes the promise. You make the problems. Okay. We make the problems. When we start trying to do stuff our way and walk in our own provision, trying to meet God's needs, like he needs help. He don't need help. And he doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. The beauty of it is he loves me and he loves you enough that he chooses and wants to use you to further his glory. And this, this is why we walk by faith, not by sight. You have to fully trust in God about it. Mm. Think about it. Abraham is told to leave everything behind for an unknown. You're going to get land. You're going to get, a, 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 you're, you'll be a, a great nation through your descendants and you'll be a blessing that will affect the entire world, which is obviously Jesus. And he's given the promises and everybody likes to shout about the promises. I could stand up here and we can, we can go on and on about, oh, the, God has promised you this and he's going to do this in your life and, and he's got this promise for you. And you'll stand up and you'll shout, maybe there's a lot of white people in here, but uh, <laughs> y'all quiet. And we'll shout about the promises, but we always want to neglect the other side of it, which is the pain that comes with the promise. He's promised land, but there's the pain of leaving the land that you know and you see currently for something that you have no idea what it looks like. You're promised to be a great nation, but now you have the pain of leaving your entire, almost your entire family behind, and you don't even have a family of your own yet. See, we, we, we find out, you know, later on that, you know, they're 75 and Sarah's womb was barren. Well, you can't find out that your womb is barren unless you, y'all do the math. There was other things that led to knowing that the womb was barren. So you got to leave the family behind to move to a new area. Or maybe you have to quit a secure job to move forward into something completely unsure. Leaving your father and your mother to establish yourself in your new identity in your marriage, in your marriage, in your marriage, not in your single relationship, in your marriage. You ain't supposed to live with somebody unless you, that's not going to. Or maybe God has called you to give until it hurts a little bit because he wants you to trust him to see him grow something from it. And the pain that that can cause, the pain that comes with the promise can put a stop to the promise if you let it. But realize this, the pain of faith never outweighs the promise of God. The pain of faith never outweighs the promise of God. We get so hung up on what God's answers are and when they don't line up with our expectations. We think, okay, my back hurts. Jesus, please heal my back. Oh, no, it still hurts. God's not there. And God, oh, I thought, you know, I was throwing up after drinking all night and I thought, you know, if I just said, Jesus, please take it away and heal me, I'll never drink again. But here I am still throwing up in the toilet. Or God, I thought that you would deliver my child from their addiction and I haven't talked to them in three weeks and I don't know where they're even at. God, this situation is not looking like I thought it was gonna look. It looks completely different than what I had put in my head. And when we look at Abraham, we realize he had no idea what he was doing. He had no idea how it was gonna look. He didn't have a template that he could go by. He didn't have a support group that he could text somebody on. He didn't have a horrible Android phone that he could spend five minutes waiting for a response back on because they don't have iMessage. Uh, he didn't have a mentor. Man, y'all quiet today. He didn't have a mentor. Everything was new. He didn't have a template. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't have a template for what temptation would look like, how to deal with it. He didn't have a template for what the tests were going to look like. He only had trust in God. And everything he does from this point forward is going to feel new, new. That's what faith is. As you walk by faith, everything that you do, everything that you do should feel new. It should feel new. Yes, there are those that have gone before us, but God does a different story through you than what he did through them. So you can ask their advice, but when you go to do it, it's not gonna be the same path. You've gotta walk your own path. If you're walking behind them, following them, you're gonna end up tripping over their feet when they have their moment of, of, of testing and doubt and they stumble a little bit and then you're not gonna know who to fall back on. That's a different sermon that I wanted to preach. 
So everything is going to feel new. Everything we do as a church from this point forward, as we're moving things around and shifting things, it's going to feel new. But just because you can't see your footing, just because you can't see where you're putting your feet, doesn't mean the foundation isn't firm. Our faith is not in something feeble. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We are walking it out by faith through the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you have heard this, but it is Christ, the solid rock that we stand on. We don't have to see where we're putting our feet next because we know that the Savior keeps us stable. I don't have to rely in my feet. I've got to rely in the foundation that Jesus has already paved for me. God has ordered my steps. And all I've got to do is keep trusting him and moving forward. It doesn't need to look stable to take a step. It doesn't need to look stable to have faith. Because sometimes you're going to have shaky faith. You're going to have stable faith, and sometimes you're going to have shaky faith. But it is in these moments when you're not 100% sure, and you're not even 60% sure, that God is there to move in your maybe. Maybe this will work out better than I thought. Maybe this will work out better than I thought. Maybe what I thought wasn't the best choice and maybe what I thought was a bad thing will turn out to be an amazing blessing because God just may be who he says he is and he is working it out for my good, but it just may be looking different and a different process than what I have thought in my head. Look at Peter. When God, when Jesus stepped, well, God, yeah, Jesus, God, When Jesus is on the water and he walks up and he calls Peter forth, come out on the water and everybody, sermons all over the world, maybe even one today, right now, everybody talks about, oh, he took his eyes off Jesus and as soon as he stopped looking at Jesus, that's when he started to stumble. So, you know, you just always got to keep your focus on Jesus and as long as you focus on Jesus, it doesn't matter what you're doing and I'm not ever going to take my eyes off Jesus and I'm going to pull out in traffic and just say, Jesus, take the wheel because as long as Jesus does it and I don't lose focus on Jesus, he'll, he'll see me through. We always focus on Peter sinking. We don't focus on Peter stepping. We don't focus on how he was the only one of the 12 disciples that had just enough faith to step out of the boat. He had just enough faith to listen to Jesus and to do. We always focus on him stumbling or when someone else in the faith has stumbled. You see all of these pastors lately stumbling in their faith. And yes, while their actions are atrocious and they're nasty, why do we celebrate the fall of someone essentially telling them, I hope you end up in hell instead of doing like Jesus said and preaching life over them and preaching that they will be humbled by the Holy Spirit and return their sight to Jesus. We always cut someone's story off when they stumble instead of when they stand back up. We always celebrate the complete fact. Or why do we not celebrate the complete fact that Peter had enough faith to actually trust Jesus and say, maybe this will work. And then he struts out on the surf and he walks on the water. We have got to be acting on faith and celebrating God moving in our faith. But we have to move past the trust issues that we have within ourselves. Because God says move and we want a map quest print out of it. That's a little dated. God said step on the waves and you, you were like, oh, I thought you said ways. I thought you said type it in ways so I can look forward and uh, look ahead and see all the obstacles that are coming at me that are hiding my opportunities. Because, you know, God, I I really trust that you have a plan for me. But if you could just lay it all out and put me some bullet points and tell me, you know, how much time is this going to take? Where is this going to take me? How much do I need to work on it? Because I'm I'm really busy right now, God. And it's a little hard to read just one chapter a day in my Bible, you know. But if you could even tell me how much money it's going to actually, you know what, God, make it free. Because I want to buy a new house and a new boat and a new car and a new PS5 or 6 or whatever they're coming out with now, God. If you could just do all that, that's not how faith works. Faith is figuring it out while you're walking it out. Everybody says fake it till you make it. You got to faith it until you make it. Yeah. 
we want to treat God like the GPS in our phones. Typing it in, see the destination, plan out the details. Kelsey is the king, queen, not king. Whoa, not that kind of church. (laughs) The queen of ways. We'll be like ready to go. And she's spending like 20 minutes over there typing it in on ways, looking ahead on the path and seeing which way to go. And most of the time, I'm so impatient. I'm like, and I'm telling myself, I'm like, good God, can we just get on the road? Can we please go? But she always finds a better route and a faster route. So something that can, uh, something that can grind my gears a little bit turns out to be a much better thing. For instance, when we, when we went up to Ocean Isle a couple weeks ago, the crazy directions that you texted us, which is like reading Morse code for a, a Helen Keller, you have no idea where to turn. And finally, she typed it in the phone in, in ways. And we ended up like home an hour before the drive up took. So, but uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we want to treat God like a GPS to see how long it's going to take. And a GPS, I think it's funny. It's called the global positioning system, right? The global positioning system. Because you can look to the world to see how you want to do your life. You can look to the world to see what your personality is, what career choice is the best personality or best choice for your personality. You can look to the world to see if, if you're trying to start up a business. I can look to the world and see, okay, I need to do this, 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 and this in that order. And as long as I follow this path and, and, and put all my, my money and my time and my resources into this, I can follow this. I can look to the world to tell me, okay, if I'm going into this career, I need to go to this school for X amount of years, get this training. Or if you're smarter and you go into a trade instead of college, I'm in college, so whatever, but I already did the trade part. I'm going backwards. But you know, you could go into a trade and okay, uh, I'll take mine. I was in utilities. You got to be a groundman for a few years. You got to learn the ropes. And then once you learn that, then you're an apprentice. And then you go to a lead. And then once you're through with lead for a few years, then uh, if please God, if you're smart enough, you can be a foreman. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. But um, yeah, so as long as you, you, know, you follow what the world says, you can end up where you want to end up and plan out your entire life. Just like GPS, the global positioning system. But we follow a different GPS. We follow Jesus, the God positioning system. And it is this GPS that it takes faith to follow because you are only given one option at a time. You're not given the, the, the ETA. You're not given what obstacles are going to pop up. You're not going to be given if you're going to get a flat tire, where to stop for gas, when the next rest stop is for the kids that have to use the bathroom. You're not going to know any of that, the only thing you're going to know is the word go. You get the green light to go. He's going to say go, and it is up to you to follow him in faith and keep walking that out. And yes, you will have seasons of walking in faith where God said go, and sometimes you're going to wonder if maybe you misheard him. Because, you know, I've been doing this for a while, and nothing's really going on, and nothing's happening. I haven't seen much of a change in the scenery here, God, so are you still here Did you really say go, God? You know, just give me a sign. Give me something that I can know that you're still here, God, right? But you need to be like Abraham. And you have to keep going without knowing. Can you put verse 1 back up, please? Genesis 12, verse 1. God said, go from your country. Go from your country, your people in your father's household. And I didn't read verse four, but put verse four up. So Abram went. God said, go. So Abram went. So Abram went. So Abram went. So Abram went. He didn't have to call the pastor to have a meeting about it. He didn't have to come to the altar and pray about it. He didn't need 67 elders in the church to get together and vote about it. He didn't need to seek somebody's advice about it. He didn't have to come down and be covered by the prayer and the anointing oil and do anything like that. He didn't do anything except fully trust in God and follow him in faith and took action. He was given a command. He was told to go, and he went. He was called, and he goes. He never hesitated in his obedience. Never hesitated in his obedience. When he was told to do something by God, he did it. He did it. 
He followed God completely in his faith because his faith in God was greater than anything else in his life, even his love for his own son, his promised son that he waited a hundred years for. Not Hagar and Ishmael. That was the mess up. That was him trying to speed up God's plan and do things on his own. And we still see the problems of that today over in the East. What would it take for us to have this type of faith? Why? I want to know why does the American church not generally show this level of faith? And since you come here and I have the microphone and I get to be unfiltered to a degree, I think it's because we have gotten complacent in our calling that we are doing more consuming in the church than we are contributing to the church. Oh, it's not going to preach, but I'm going to go there. We will sit still in the seats and never serve, wanting to be fed, relying on this to be your devotional for the week. Relying on this to be your, your daily walk. We want to get fed, but never have the faith to trust God with our entire being. And I really felt like when God was giving me this, that it was like a rally cry. I felt it within me. This is like a rally cry for us to get our butt off the sidelines and stop being stuck because we want to focus on how things used to be. Think about it. We see it now with the city. Booming in growth, and traffic is atrocious. And if people knew how to drive, you could probably get a bicycle and be, get there quicker, but you're probably going to get killed. And you're not even going to see it coming, unless you're one of those people that rides the wrong way down the... Never mind. Moving on. But we see this. The city is growing, and there's people moving here to escape. We don't even know what they're trying to escape. An abusive past, an abusive current situation. Maybe they're trying to escape... California, <laughs> that goes, I don't even need to go there. Uh, and they're coming to Florida for a reason. And yes, we get our, uh, our hackles will start to rise. I just want to see how that sounded. Our hackles will start to rise. And we're like, oh, there's so much traffic here. And I hate this. It used to be so good. And, and I remember dad told me the story that he used to ride when he was a kid, ride a bicycle from Crescent Beach to where Target is now. And it was nothing but trees. Beautiful. But <laughs> for each and every one of us, the world that we grew up in is dead. And that's not fun to hear. I'm not as old as some of the people in this room. You're not as young as me. And we all have different stories. But the entire world for each and every one of us, what we grew up in, that's gone. And sitting here dreaming about yesterday and what it used to be does nothing except keep you, keep you stuck and complacent instead of moving forward. And we see it. When a church starts to grow, people are immediately like, oh, this is getting too big. It's too hard to find parking. I don't like how long the younger guy goes now. Uh, I miss when the churches sang hymns. And we get stuck in yesterday's provision that we never move forward into tomorrow's promise and tomorrow's purpose. God does not want you stuck in yesterday. He doesn't want you stuck in the same mindset from the last seven years ago when someone hurt you. He wants you to follow him every single day. I think about this church and I thought about this church as I was writing this and God guiding me. This church was founded 39 years ago. And I don't know, how long were you in the first building? Three years. You didn't have to whisper. Three years. And then, there we go. We have crowd mics now. Three years in the first building started with seven people. What a wonderful number to start with. Seven people. And then after that, moved into the King's Estates, which is now a lighthouse, Beacon Hope, whatever. Was in there. And then we moved into this building in 2004, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And for some of us, Great, that's fine. We've made some updates. The sound sounds better. Looks a whole lot different. The stage doesn't have that disgusting tan wood floor or whatever that was when we first moved in. Thank God we have real drums and not electric drums because those are from Satan. Um, and we think it's fine and we'll come in here and it looks great and it sounds great and we'll come in week in and week out and we come in and sit and some of us, some of us will sing, but we refuse to get stretched. 39 years, 39 years. That is a long, I haven't even been alive that long. That's a long time for a story. 
for the church's story, but I do not believe for one single second that this is where the story ends. It doesn't end, not like we're going out of business or whatever, or the church is falling apart. This building is not where we end. This is not where this ends. God cannot be contained to this building, and he will not be contained to this building. And I firmly believe that every single thing that you have done for the last 39 years was to show and was to plant a seed, planting a seed. And a seed is something that takes a long time to grow. And just after Abraham had Isaac, he plants, this is so obscure, he plants a tree, he plants a seed, a tamarisk tree, to be specific. This is a very slow growing tree, about, I think it said a half an inch to an inch a year, like several of the things we got to get privacy in, in our front yard. Buy bamboo if you want something that grows fast. He plants a tamarisk tree. Now, obviously, when he planted it, it's not like the Hulk, and he had a fully grown tree, so I don't know if it was, you know, like a little whatever, or if it was just the seed, but he plants something that is slow growing, that will literally provide him no benefit at all during his life. Too small to have any immediate impact, but he planted it to show his commitment to and faith to God's promise, even though he would never see the use of it. And this might be a stretch, but I searched up where he planted it and where everything was. And while he planted something that he couldn't use and it was slow growing, there was uh, another group of people some 400 years later that had to pass through the area after coming out of exile, after spending 400 years stuck in Egypt and being slaves. They are passing through uh, on a path to their new promise, to their new land in a hot desert, having to find water, which God provided, uh, and, and, you know, the food and, and the manna and everything, but they're passing through, and the day is still going to be hot. I don't know about you. Uh, you know, they got the, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. It's still hot in the shade. I don't know how hot it gets over there. So Abraham has planted this tree, and he never sees the benefit of it. But 400 years after he plants it, his descendants that he would have had no idea, would have been passing through the same area. And maybe, just maybe, that slow-growing tree that provided Abraham with no benefit would have been steadily growing year after year after year, and it would have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger until the point that it could finally provide shade. The seed grew to provide (laughs) Shade. Shade for those leaving pain behind and moving towards their purpose. Shade for those leaving their past behind and moving towards their promise. He planted something that he wouldn't benefit from, but the future generations would be blessed by its existence. A tree such as this church is and will remain to be a hospital for the broken a place for you to leave pain behind and to move forward, a place for you to leave your past behind and move forward. But there comes a time in your life that maybe you have planted something a long time ago and you've been praying about it day after day and night after night and maybe even year after year. And you've been wandering around in darkness trying to figure out when God is going to show up, how's he going to do it? And you're sitting here today saying, I don't feel like anything has happened. I don't feel God involved in my story. I don't know what God wants to do. And I don't feel like God has blessed me yet. I planted something, but in reality, I just feel like I've been buried. I've been buried under this pressure. I've been buried under this weight. I've been buried under these bills buried under depression, buried under addiction, buried under the lies that people have told about me, buried under the stress, buried under the pain, buried under every single thing that life has thrown at you. But I want to remind you today that what God does is he takes what the enemy means for evil and he turns it for good. He takes something that was buried and he brings it back to life. 
He gives things new meanings. He gives things new names. He took Abram and changed him into Abraham. He took Simon and changed him into Peter. He took Saul and renamed him Paul and used him for a purpose because he takes something that what the world thinks is bad or what the world says sounds bad, something that could have been bad, and he changes it. So while you think you have been buried and you feel like the darkness has swallowed you whole, take about five seconds and shift your mentality, shift your thinking, and give a shout to the God who turns your situation around and tell yourself, I have not been buried, I've been planted. All the dirt the enemy has thrown on top of me has done nothing but just give God good soil. It gave God fertile ground. And now he's about to send the rain and you're about to burst forth into something new. Burst forth forth from the ground and be made into something brand new. God is about to take your life and change it. And he's gonna take this church and change it and move it into greater levels. It has been planted and now it is the season of the harvest. And there's greater things in store, but you have to be ready to move. You can't stay stuck. He wants to give you more and he's calling you to do something. But are you still stuck seeking him in prayer over what he has already told you to do? Read your Bible more. Oh, I'm I'm going to pray about where to start because I just don't want to flip it open and, you know, but I'm never going to take it off the shelf. Give more to the church. Okay, I'll pray about the amount, God. Once you put a number in my, oh, not that one. Nope, that can't be God. That's the devil. Okay, God, he says, you know, just give what's in your pocket right now. Well, no, no, that's scary. And God says, maybe now you'll trust me in faith. But we put our trust in the wrong things and we never move forward. We will never move forward until we have the faith like Abraham to just do it, to trust God and see what happens, to see where he takes us. But we extend the process because we trust what we have, what we already have, and not what God has to give. You cannot put your trust in your own life. You can't put your trust in your job or your family or your friends. Your trust definitely cannot be in your bank account. If I put my trust in my bank account, I am an atheist the first time I check the balance. But we keep putting our trust in what we do because we think God provides for us. But when we really need to be trusting fully in the work that he already did and provided everything that we will already need. And he is calling us to take action, but we are stuck being apathetic. And Abraham is noted and he is written down in Hebrews as being the father of faith, as having so much faith. But you see that he had bouts of of apathy. See, after he planted the tree and Isaac is born, it says that he stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. In the next chapter, which is uh, Genesis 22, it says, after some time, God calls on Abraham to test him, to test his faith with sacrificing Isaac. And that's a weird thing, and I don't want to get into it. We always trip up over it. But we always realize... It wasn't about sacrificing Isaac. It was about reawakening his faith, reawakening Abraham's faith. And it doesn't say that he prayed about it. It doesn't say he was like, God, are you sure? The Bible says he rose up early the next morning to do so. And God provided a ram in his place. He didn't provide a Chevy or a Ford. He provided a ram. But uh, we end up, God tells us to do something and we, we end up settling and we, and we settle in something and then we, we just relabel it and, you know, we're like, oh, this is, this is just part of my process. God is just, you know, he told me to do something, but I think he told me to stop and just wait right here. And, you know, this is part of the process. But is it process or have you just been procrastinating and calling it progress? You know, I'm just looking for the right place to serve or are you really just stalling? You guys know what the eyesore of I-4 is? Has anybody ever heard of that? If you go down I-4 and there's that glass building that they started and however much almost finished, and it's mostly done, but it's just sitting there undone. And maybe they ran out of money or maybe they just abandoned it. I don't know. Maybe somebody does. But we drive past it and we wonder, you know, why did they start this and never finish it? But we never stop and think, you know, we're living our lives in much the same way. We start something and then it gets difficult and then we abandon it and look for the next shiny thing for our dopamine hit. 
and we'll try to learn something and we'll quit. We'll try to do something and we'll quit. And we don't stay committed. God is calling you to stay committed, fully committed to him. Commitment doesn't quit. Commitment doesn't quit. See, as, as we move forward in this process as the church, there's people that you thought were committed that are not going to be committed anymore because things are changing, because things are shifting. And when there is the shifting, there is the sifting. And when things start sifting, people don't like that because we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't want to be stretched. We don't want to be tested in our faith. We just want everything to feel good. And then, you know, poof, we're in heaven with Jesus and everything's fun now. It is an uncomfortable process. Sanctification is lifelong and it is uncomfortable to have your impurities rise to the surface. Nobody wants to face that kind of stuff, but it is essential. And there's times where things begin to come up to the surface. And yes, it's uncomfortable, but you can't just push it back down and rebury it. That only compounds your problem and compounds your issues. And you can keep running and running and running and running, but God is still right on your heels to make something happen because he wants to use you. He wants to use you. And when he wants to use you is when he he will use you. And he will put an obstacle, well, he won't, yeah, whatever. He gives you an opportunity. It will be hidden behind an obstacle. Your opportunities, your greatest opportunities do not come when you've got enough sleep. They don't come when you've got all the money in your bank. They don't come when everything is all kosher and everything's good. And you know, oh, I've got all the kids are moved out and I've got all the money saved up. And now I'm ready for God to use me because I don't have any other distractions. That's not how opportunities come. They don't come like that. They come when it's going to be crazy and chaotic. When you have nothing other to do than trust God. You, 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 you can't just stay dormant until you get to the doors of heaven. And I'm trying to hurry. I'm not, I know I'm going a little bit longer, but... Whew. Because I see... If you can bring my, my chair, please. I'm tired of standing. I'm just kidding. We have, um, thank you. Thank you. Give it up. Thank you. That's good, man. Thank you. All right, sit down. I'm just kidding. I'm doing it. You're ready, though. I appreciate it. <clears throat> See, it's funny. We, um, you look at this chair, normal chair, and we look at our faith in Jesus and we, we settle, right? We have faith. We have complete faith. We've put our faith in Jesus that he will save us and that we will have eternal life and we will not face eternity in hell and not be separated from God. And we're okay with saving faith. But then we settle, oh yeah, for safe faith, right? Did any of you, when you came in today, sit before you sat in the chair, did you look at the chair? Did you go over it, you know, unless you're like a psychopath and, you know, I don't think anybody was over here, you know, checking, you know, all the screws to make sure it's still glued in. I'm going to call the 800 number on the back to make sure, you know, there's still a company and, you know, but, you know, it's got nice back support. No, we just went like this, right? We trusted the chair completely, trusted it to be safe to sit in, didn't think anything about it. These chairs are older than some of the people in the room. <laughs> they're 20 years old. Nobody sat down and they were like, oh my gosh. Oh, okay, no, we sat down. Ah, and it felt safe. And this is what we end up doing in our walk with Jesus. See, God says, go. God says, I'm calling you in to do something and I want you to do something. And even though we trust this chair and we trust the maker of this chair, we don't trust the maker of our lives and our souls and our eternity. And just like we all laughed about how if we would never check the screws and make sure the glue is all good and there's still bars on the bottom or whatever so that we won't fall out when God tells us to do something, we're like, well, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not quite ready for that yet. I need, I need to know how long it's going to take. I need to know what it's going to look like. How much money is it going to take? 
Who's going to leave my life? Who's going to hurt me? Because I thought they were going to be here forever, but God didn't want them in my life in the first place, and I'm the one that put them there. And God says, do something, and we're like, whoa, whoa, nope. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. We trust the maker of the chair, but we don't trust the maker of our lives. And just like none of us would sit here and, and see what to do with the chair before we sat down, when it comes to God, we get stuck weighing all the cost that we never move into the calling. And we, we look at all the risks of faith over the rewards of faith. <clears throat> and there is a risk. There is a risk. But is it, is it really a risk? I mentioned earlier I had the utilities career. Obviously, I risked my life for the career. But when I moved into this, I risked my family's future. And it could still be a risk. Do I believe that? No. God's got me. But I don't know where this is going to end up. I don't know how this is going to look in a few years. And we consider things a risk because we are relying on the wrong person. We're relying on ourself. And that is the real risk, not relying on your Redeemer. When you rely on yourself, that is the risk. Because is following God truly a risk? Think about it. If you know that his ways are not your ways and his thoughts are not your thoughts, is it really a risk? Is it really a risk that he is working everything out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Is it really a risk? And newsflash, we're all called according to his purpose. Is it really a risk that the God who gave up everything to come down and die for you so that you can be resurrected when he was resurrected? Is it really a risk that he gave you the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead? Is it really a risk that the same God that spoke everything into existence until it came time to make man and then he got his hands in the dirt to do it? Is it really a risk? Because he is able to do exceedingly more than you ask or think or imagine. Is it really a risk to follow him in faith wherever he is leading you to? If you know it's for your good, and if you know that he has good plans for you, and if you know that he is in your today as much as he is in your tomorrow, is it really a risk for you to rely on him for everything in your life? If everything he wants to do for you and give you is for your good, that is not a risk. That is a gift. Exactly. I heard, I heard this story. I heard this story of a time that Steve Jobs took someone around uh, through an Apple plant to show him all the stuff that they hadn't released yet, but they were still designing. And the guy was asking them when it was going to come out. And he thought they were all great and amazing and everything, but they hadn't been released yet. But he got to see a glimpse of it. What has God designed for you that you haven't seen yet? And you notice in Hebrews, all the things, all the people in Hebrews, it says that it was done by faith. It is the highlight. And back in, in, in Hebrews 10, it says, by my righteous, but I'm sorry, but my righteous ones will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. God takes no pleasure in those who do not live by faith. But that means by default that every time you do live by faith, he is getting glory from it. He is taking pleasure in it, and he loves it. So that sounds like the best option to me. Living by faith should be your only option, and it is not just an option. It is an opportunity, and our entire belief is based on faith in Jesus, faith in his sacrifice, faith in eternal life. It is the opportunity for more, to live for more. And I want to know, what will your by faith story be? By faith, you started a business that ended financial famine for your family. 
by faith. You set an example for your kids when you had no example to go on because you didn't have a parent growing up. By faith, you ended the addiction. By faith, you broke the chains of generational curses because you refused to see your children walk in the same brokenness that you inherited from your parents. By faith, you stand up against a school board that is crushing the innocence of children. By faith, you, give your, you gave your last dollar to a church because you believed in the vision of saving the lost. By faith, you followed God into a calling that you're not equipped yet for. By faith, you trusted God with every fiber of your being to see what he had in store for you. And by faith, you see it come to pass. By faith, we set our eyes on things unseen. Verse 16, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We are headed to a better country. We are headed to a better city. So set your sights on the things unseen, the new country, the heavenly country, a country with many houses, many mansions, the place of perfect peace and harmony, because all eternity you will be with God. So set your sights ahead, church, because by faith, where you have been is not where you are going. Your story did not stop in your past. It is still propelling you into your future. And there is no other option. There is no better opportunity than to place your faith in Jesus. Because living by faith is not just an option. It is an opportunity. The opportunity to see God work through you, to see what he wants to do through you, to see how he wants to use you in his story. Kick the chair to the side and quit sitting down and getting comfortable. God doesn't want you comfortable. He's got you called. He's got you anointed. He's got a purpose for your life. There's people at your job that need to hear Jesus through you. There's people at your school that need to hear Jesus through you. And maybe you're scared of it and you think, oh, well, God can use someone else. What if you are literally the only believer in your realm of friends or at your job or in the immediate circle of friends or whatever at your school? What if you are the only person and you are the catalyst that lets these people find Jesus and start living for Jesus and you are the only person that stands between heaven and hell? because you are supposed to be the one that's supposed to talk to them about Jesus, but you're too busy being comfortable because you're not a, you don't know what to say. That sounds way more harsh than I intended. But think about it. There is people dying every single day. More and more. Every day. And they're stuck sitting down. They're stuck living in the past. They are stuck over here dying. Because if you are not living for God, you are just dying. You cannot sit still in your faith. That means your faith is dying. Faith without works is dead. It is not our works that save us. It is the only complete finished work of Jesus that saves us. But when you live for Jesus and he truly grasps you and you truly grasp him and he gets a hold of him, it doesn't keep you standing still in this spot. It keeps you moving forward. And sometimes you won't know what to do. And it'll look a little shaky at first. But you've got to follow the GPS. You've got to follow the God positioning system. And you've got to take a step. And maybe it won't be a big step. And sometimes you might trip and you'll go backwards just a little bit. But God is still there to pick you up, to take another step forward, and to take another step forward, and take another step forward. And sometimes there will be something in your path that you didn't expect. A divorce. A child in addiction. Someone doing something to you that you couldn't imagine ever happening. And there's this giant obstacle that you can't see any way around or through. And your immediate reaction is to backpedal and to repel yourself because moving forward past that hurts way more than moving backwards and going to, to how you used to be. And you're stuck. There's something that happened years ago and you're stuck right here 
and you can't get past because the pain of that brokenness from 15 years ago is keeping you from moving forward 15 steps into the future. But God doesn't want you stuck right here. All you've got to do is take another step and take another step and take another step and go around the obstacle. You think of a horse that has blinders on it and that's how we walk. We see just this and I can't see any way around it. And I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to sit here. And for many people today, unfortunately, somebody will completely ignore this and they will sit stuck against their obstacle in one spot, just like this. Because the pain of ripping the blinders off and realizing all I've got to do is just shift a little bit and then move forward. The pain of ripping that off hurts more than the pain of walking backwards and returning to something that left you more broken than it would be if you took that and just stepped through the pain and moved forward into your promise. Every single person in this room is called. Every single person is called. Every single person is in here for a reason, to do something, to reach someone. If we can't bow our heads in a moment, they'll sing one more worship song. And I, I really believe that God is calling us to get off of the sidelines, to rip the blinders off, to be sifted so we can be shifted. And like it or not, this will move forward. This will move forward. With or without you, God will move it forward. But without you, there's something missing in the kingdom without you because you're supposed to fulfill a part. We are many parts of the body of Christ. And while yes, you can function without a finger or two or a toe or two, is that really how God wants it to operate? No. He wants it all together so he gets all the glory. So he shows everybody just what he can do through each and every one of us. And today, if you are here and you have never given your life to Jesus and you feel that pull forward, that is the Holy Spirit convicting you, not condemning you. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came to save it. And if you're recognizing that you need a difference in your life and you're recognizing that God is calling you on a different path and what you're living in right now is not your future. Your past is not your purpose. It's a piece of it, but it is not the end game. And your condition is not your conclusion. God is calling you out but you have to be available. He wants you to be available. Like he called Abraham out of a pagan culture where they literally worshiped a false God named sin. Abraham was available and he stayed available and he trusted God with every fiber of his being, everything in him. He didn't waver. He didn't stop. God said, go, and he obeyed, and he went. And he is credited as the father of faith. And we are here today because he answered God's call. Today, if you, if you feel that, if you feel God tugging at you, or maybe you just, you've been stumbling and you've been tripping and you want a new beginning, I want to lead us in a prayer and we do it corporately as a church for those that are far from God coming back to him are those who are saying it for the first time or the first time in a long time. And I say it every, every time. It is, it, it is not a magical prayer. It's not a get out of hell free card. It is an opportunity for you to believe and apply the Bible, which says if you believe with your mouth, and believe, or believe in your heart that Jesus is your Savior and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. 
but that's not where your story ends. It's not just about getting to heaven. It's about God getting the glory. It's about worshiping God. It's about serving God. It's about following God. It's not just about the shiny mansion in the streets of gold. That's a benefit, but being with God is the blessing. And today, if we can, all together, just repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for sending your Son to die for my sins. Jesus, I believe that you died for me and you rose again so that I may live with you, through you, and for you. Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Spirit. Empty me of me and fill me with you. I will follow you, Lord, all of my days. Amen. Amen. There is, I love that part, there is a party in heaven for anybody that has just came to Jesus, whether you're online or in the house, whatever it may be. If that is your first time, or your first time just meaning it instead of just repeating it, there is a party in heaven. The angels are rejoicing over the fact that your, your soul is saved. But this is not where your story ends. It is not just about repeating a prayer and then that's it. God wants you to do more. He wants you more. He wants all of you. And it's okay when you stumble. It's okay when you trip because he is there to pick you up. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. He just expects you to follow him. He already sees you as perfect just because of the finished work of Jesus. But are you available for where he wants to take you? And in a moment when they sing, if you need prayer, come to the altar. And there will be people to pray with you, to pray for you, or if you just want to pray, just you and Jesus, just come forward. And if not, just worship him for the next few minutes. I promise you'll still beat the Baptist to lunch. Just worship Jesus because he did everything for you, everything for you, for you to have the best life imaginable before you get to heaven, before you get to heaven. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.